Hi all on Play Chess and also streaming to YouTube. Uh, hi all there. Ahem. I thought this week we could uh, continue from last week uh, and look at some historical games which uh, chess games com consider the best of the best. Uh, now the years are of this best of the best is uh, it's 19th century 1800 1899 there's 10 games which uh, are really really liked and some of these are totally iconic tonight totally iconic if you haven't seen them you should have seen them basically and it's interesting to first of all I'd like to say also it's very very interesting for me to check historical games uh, at, you know to revisit them because it's something which uh, you know, years back when uh, you know I had this book called Five Hundred Master Games of Chess, and some of the games are just really, really fascinating. And I think some of the charm of them is that they're less complex, really, than modern games. They're less complex, less uh, about the openings, more about the creativity, the ideas. Uh, and it's interesting. It's just really, really interesting. And some players of the era really stand out, actually, compared to others in in such a dramatic way. So one such player is Paul Morphy, and of course everyone's probably seen this game, but let's go over it anyway, because sometimes you can get a new perspective. So this is Paul Morphy, uh, the the classic opera game, Knight of the Opera, <laughs> at the opera. So Paul Morphy um, was wanting to win this game quickly to carry on watching the opera, and he was playing against uh, Duke Carl and Count Iswald with white. So I'm sure everyone's seen this game, but let's have a look anyway. So e4, and they played e5. It seems totally, you know, a logical basis, just classic e5, knight f3. But now d6. d6 actually, uh, from a kind of abstract, more abstract perspective, why, why is d6 inferior? Why is it considered inferior to uh, knight c6 nowadays? If we look at live book, uh, knight c6 by far, I believe is the most popular reply. D6 actually, if we think about it, is already weakening a bit. Well, it's it's changing the pawn structure. It's already creating some potential light square weaknesses. You see that? And yeah, knight C6 isn't touching the pawn chain. After D4, there's already pressure on E5, and it's uncomfortable now actually to play knight C6. Uh, if knight C6 happens, you know maybe. Actually, put one on the kibitzer as well. Uh, it's already uncomfortable to do this because white could simply <clears throat> take on e5. Here, we're probably, um, uh, you know, uh, a very uncomfortable position for black or any. Like here, it's it's just it's just that's not great. So already, this position is a little bit on the passive side. The Philidor defense is a bit named after Philidor. It's a bit on the pass passive side compared to knight c6 and to do to deal with this issue already this is like a, an emergency move already which can potentially f further weaken black's light squares because if we're giving up this light square bishop yeah these light squares are going to be further weakened uh, from the absence of this light square bishop especially if white has a light square bishop and black doesn't if this really is going to capture on f3 it's it's a bit controversial here no, black's pawns are on dark squares, so black's kind of potentially weakening uh, his light squares even more, and that does happen here after d takes. So uh, we have here a situation black cannot afford to take now because of queen takes d a check, and then knight takes e five. So black's giving up this light square bishop, and that's that's really in Paul Morphy's hands. These trump cards. Uh, like better central control, faster development, but also you know when he has a bishop that the opponent hasn't got, then that whole it's it's an advantage on a color complex basically. We could say it's a big advantage on that light square color complex, which black has already weakened. So we hit, on that light square color complex, there's targets particularly f7 and b7. They're both coincidentally light squares. This one can can hit quite easily. And, and the queen can also hit quite easily both of these squares as examples of 
the fact that black is actually weaker on the light squares quite significantly already at this stage. I mean, this, these are the ingredients which Paul Morphy uses to later find crushing combinations, to later find crushing forcing moves. As Fisher said uh, once, tactics flow from a better position. In Paul Morphy's case, the, the trump cards he's collecting to get that better position include advantage on a color complex, you know, rapid development and stuff. So this is, this is already forcing black into contortions, just the F7 issue. Because after knight f6, black is forced into contortions now after queen b3, which is a nice double attack and use of that berry, targeting b7 and f7. The contortion queen e7 is unfortunate, uh, blocking in the bishop. I mean, the bishop's going to have to take time to Vincetto, but there is a threat of queen b4 here as well at the moment. And instead of just going for a pawn, which will allow queen b4, Paul Morphy, Paul Morphy wants a quicker knockout blow that then is afforded by what it might be theoretically the strongest move to allow this but he doesn't want this because this would prolong the game quite a bit he wants to carry on watching the opera so actually he stops queen b4 and just plays knight c3 tying down the queen actually because it's not check and if this did happen then we can just take on f7 anyway so they're not really going to do that so basically yeah the light square issues have led to uh, a development um, traffic jam here for black. Uh, c6 is played to, yeah, resourcefully guard. Now the queen is guarding both those light squares, b7 and f7. And we have this nasty pin. Um, <clears throat> Fisher's also like annotated this game. Uh, there's, there's a YouTube video of Fisher going up over this classic game with actually a demo board. Um, and he's said something that Black's in a sort of zugzwang already here. Can't develop his Queen's Knight because the pawn's hanging. Uh, the Bishop is blocked in because of the Queen. Yeah, I mean, the, the observations are uh, not revolutionary here. Um, so Black plays b5, trying to get out of this kind of bind. Uh, now, so here, I'm pretty sure everyone's seen this game, but just, just in case someone hasn't so what do you think uh white plays here white to play here uh if you haven't seen this game now if you have seen this game just say you've seen this game so i'm, I'm posting that question on stream here i hope maybe, maybe one of you hasn't seen this game i don't know 100 um, percent but if you haven't seen this game it's it's kind of it's it's a really classic game really <clears throat> uh Okay, so uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's now okay. He doesn't want to retreat the bishop because that would actually significantly help Black. After knight B D seven, Black could actually be threatening even knight C five. Which would hit the queen and also put pressure on e4. That's a, that's actually a threat here, knight c5, um, which comes close to equalising. And the same thing as the bishop goes here, knight bd7, with this threat of knight c5, is actually black's you know going to be actually actually miles better potentially. Uh, funny enough, uh, if white castle. Uh, queenside, I think it's almost a total disaster actually. Knight c5 uh, and then b4, end of game. <laughs> because I know this is like an iconic game, but actually it's funny that this could be a total disaster for white losing the queen like that. <clears throat> yeah, you know, queen b4, knight takes is losing the queen. So actually, you know, b5 with knight d7 to c5. You don't want that, but in fact, because Black's king is in the center, this this attacking move is too optimistic. It's too optimistic because Black hasn't put himself beyond defeat. Uh, to play like this is optimistic, and in fact, all the downsides of Black's position are exposed instead, particularly the king in the center. 
and actually often so white plays knight takes b5 and there's still a chance to be annoying if they wanted to be annoying they could play this check to try and get the queens off they didn't so after knight c3 they could take the queens off and be really really annoying about it why it's technically better but it would be a few more moves but um, thankfully for Morphy they, they weren't they, they played ball they accepted that sack uh, so Bishop takes b5 and now we get massive lead and development with the cast, castling queenside to the rooks automatically uh, hitting d7 uh, so blacks playing rook d8 and now we get a lovely forcing move combination which just absolutely is is winning by force so basically I mean in a way it's 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 a symptom of, of the whole opening how the whole opening wasn't a great way of defending e5 how black had light square weaknesses but now they're they're punished drastically so uh, rook takes d7 rook d1 and now if you haven't seen this game before I'll let you guess uh, the f this killer move here so white to play here um, <clears throat> so white to play here especially if you haven't seen this game it's a delightful move here <laughs> okay I'm pretty sure most of you have seen this game you should have seen it anyway so so the beauty of forcing moves in chess they're the if then of if you're a computer programmer they're like if then conditions the, the most clinical types of forcing moves where you have really restricted the opponent's options to just one or two legal responses uh, certainly like if thens in programming so queen b8 absolutely forcing and then we have rook d8 checkmate i'm hoping i'm hoping i don't know if this is true or not but there might be something positionally you picked up from this perspective of the game I haven't tried to treat uh, anyone like kids when I'm talking about this game I believe the whole thing stems from light square weaknesses and if you don't pick up that point if you only pick up the point about the forcing moves you are missing I think some of the lessons that this game actually represents it's about having a bishop without a counterpart it's having and a strength on the light squares which lead to further issues of congestion pins the forcing moves are nice but it's also that build-up of how this position uh, was so superior that it, it led to those absolutely amazing forcing moves so I'm hoping you might get a little positional perspective on it that you might not have realized from this game uh, if, if you have please say please say if positionally you glimpsed something or not I mean I'm hoping you did I'm hoping you did and because because everyone's basically seen this game but I would say it's it's a symptom of you know light square weaknesses <clears throat> and the bishop without a counterpart yeah the bishop without a counterpart but light square weaknesses the bishop on the light squares the, it, was, it was lovely how the Queen uh, combined with that bishop though to create congestion okay so um yeah this is such an iconic game um <clears throat> let's look at another so this is the best of the best for, for those years i mentioned <laughs> uh these these really are totally iconic these historical they actually made it into the top 10 of the best of the best uh these these two uh, so okay Anderson was one of the best players of his era and he was playing against uh, <laughs> someone who unfortunately seemed to be on the wrong side of brilliances all the time Felix Kierskowski uh, it was always on the wrong side of brilliances and actually it, it's sad I was just reading about him the other day Felix Kierskowski he apparently he wasn't uh, that popular apparently uh, either and <laughs> in some way I think um, yeah 
there was there was something about him anyway okay um yeah K Kierzerski. so let's let's have a look at this game so uh e4 e5 we have f4 from Anderson so the King's Gambit was like one of the dominant openings of the era and he he has his own line actually in this opening in in the acceptance line uh, named after him now this is you'd think knight f3 is is like a key move to play in Leibert knight f3 guarding queen h4 is is like the most popular move in Leibert but historically at the time of this game bishop c4 i believe is is also very very popular bishop c4 just inviting queen h4 check which i believe is a kind of mistake in a way to play queen h4 check but uh, people did because it does seem to disrupt castling and we have king f1 and now a really really trendy move of of the time is is the idea of rapid construction of the sensible by both sides of that is a really really popular idea in general the rapid construction of the center even sacrificially uh, to play this and we see this move which you might think is really really quirky but it does pop up in a lot of games of the era to facilitate this rapid construction uh, we see b5 so with the idea that black is leaving in reserve things like this later <laughs> it's 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 a, a kind of yeah, gambit idea, and it takes the bishop, of course, away from the sensitive square. So we have knight f6, knight f3, queen h6, d3, and black plays knight h5, threatening actually immediately knight g3 check because of that pin. It's not just holding the pawn, it's actually got a clear and imminent threat of knight g3 check, and that's actually kind of elegantly parried here. Well, it could be parried in multiple ways. Rook g1 actually technically, technically might be good, best. Knight h4 was played, which does create a loose piece in the position. It is a funny way of addressing knight g3. But after queen g5, uh, it becomes interesting after knight f5, because note actually there's a loose piece here as well. That's another thing. So it has white already kind of blundered. He's got two pieces lined up now in this skewer which black tries to uh black could could try played actually c6 ignoring this tactical skewer if black actually tries g6 let's see g6 so if the the knight um is awkward here we actually have h4 kicking the queen off off there anyway and things get quite interesting here so knight c3 is very interesting because this knight is a tactical liability as well so it takes we can take here with white being much better so black actually um plays c6 not interested in this tactical skewer and we have now g4 so that knight is attacked in response it's moved back rook g1 now sacrificing an entire bishop is really interesting uh, the idea here onto queen g5 queen f3 so white has sacked an entire piece and has massive development advantage and after bishop takes f4 would be threatening to like win the queen because the queen hasn't got h4 that's covered by the knight so it seems like a massive position and to give the queen an escape square back a reverse gear knight g8 is played which clearly mm, isn't, isn't too hot but other moves will lose the queen no doubt uh, any other move will probably lose the queen like here yeah hmm. let's have a look at knight what's this about knight h2 check there is a tactical <laughs> even that's better for white though even that even that sequence is better for white so even though the queen's not entirely lost white can actually even just take here and be better okay um so knight g8 okay pretty awkward so like the opera game black's lack of development is evident and the queen is a massive tempo gainer here and still a massive tempo gainer because of knight c3 uh, potentially being threatened 
as well as knight takes b5 just to get into c7. Uh, we have bishop c5. Now knight d5, that huge tempo gain. Queen goes on material hunting. But meanwhile, white is now weaving, in the process of weaving a mating net around black's king with bishop d6. The, the escape squares are being cut off, perhaps not so subtly. Um, there might technically be a good uh, defensive resource here. Uh, if if white was playing computer, then taking and queen b2 is apparently, it's, it might not be apparently uh, totally winning for white. But uh, black played bishop takes g1 instead. <clears throat> and here, actually, uh, the best move technically is rook e1 with the idea of e5. Uh, just just let's have a quick look e5 i'm just going to give a token move and knight takes g7 this is well that that would be basically mating anyway the, the best move technically is is rook takes e1 but here we see e5 uh, first which is good uh as well it is strong uh, we have knight a6 and this falls into a a forcing move combination black's last hope here was bishop a6 uh, which is not immediately, black's not immediately getting mated. For example, like this, uh, white is better because look, he's on the rook. You know, if takes, we just we just take the rook and that's a mate in two, actually. But actually here, uh, black can actually get a position where he's not immediately getting mated. Yeah, he can sack the queen there. If, if there, then that's, uh, that's mate there. Okay, but anyway... Um, no, black went into a forced mate here with knight a6. So we have knight takes g7, and maybe some of you haven't seen this before, which is tragic if you haven't. So white play and win here. White play. I'll give you 20 seconds to see if you can find it. So there's a mate in two here. All right, so not bishop e7 because then knight takes e7. So it's a kind of drag and drop tactic. You want to sort of create weakness for the last move where, well, this knight's not guarding here. And you can do that by kind of drag and drop tactic where you want to deflect that knight away from e7 to be able to play bishop e7 checkmate because it's checkmate. Yeah, there was no other move here. So a really clinical forcing move, queen f6. Yeah, so these guys, Morphe and Anderson, they were pretty good on their forcing moves, but also on building up the attacking positions as well. Uh, so we see here actually a really interesting like peace sack and black really put on the defensive and beautiful forcing moves like the opera game uh, to, to win that. So that's one of the treasures of chess it's called the immortal game actually. <laughs> Yeah, so London 1851, the immortal game. It was the uh, Bishop's Gambit, Brian Counter Gambit, apparently. Okay, so um, let's let's look at another absolute iconic classic. Anderson again against Duf Dufres. Uh, let's have a look at this game. Just. A year later, this is a year later now. So Anderson again, but this time no King's Gambit. Boo, 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 boo. No King's Gambit. No King's Gambit. Knight f3. Knight c6, the superior knight c6 to d6. Bishop c4. Bishop c5. And this very, very popular, you know, to, to get this rapid construction, this is such a popular idea. b4, you can you saw that in reverse before. b4. Uh, so Evans Gambit, uh, Evans Gambit. So Black takes and White plays C3, trying to get this rapid 
center. Uh, now, this is probably the best move, bishop a5. Uh, in light book, I think, um, yeah, bishop c5 it just falls into white's plan. And that opens up this bishop. This central control is actually, it's it's very, very handy to have this position with white. It's, it's kind of dangerous. Um, so, yeah, black actually plays the much better bishop a5. We have d4, ed, white castles. And to avoid that pawn duo, white, white's plan is ruined by this d3. Nevertheless, queen b3. We have queen f6, defending f7, e5, queen g6, rook e1, knight g e7. And then bishop a3. Now here, uh, black technically might be doing quite well, apparently, with d5. It looks strange to play d5. It opens up this bishop. So if ed, c takes, black uh, can then castle because it's actually you know blunting this diagonal and this coordination so d5 might have been the best move technically but it wasn't played we have b5 uh so the point of note by the way a point of note if black castles there's anything bad going nothing bad terrible is happening there i could also consider castling but b5 is played uh which seems to promise some activity after b8 Bishop b6, and at least vacates rapidly that b7 square. So we have this coordinated pressure along this diagonal and the queen converging on g2. So knight bd2, bishop b7, with the immediate, you know, there's immediate ideas it seems brewing up on, on the diagonal. But with the king in the center, again, it seems to be a case of perhaps being a bit too optimistic without being beyond defeat with the king in the center that's having a liability in the background here of things of operations so queen f5 was played here can black actually can black actually castle here mm, it's very dangerous already to castle actually because the bishop takes d3 with the threat of knight f6 check what does black actually play here it's actually a very bad position for black this position uh, if if it gets out of that knight c5 this this is really really dangerous this position yeah it's it's mega dangerous so it, castling is actually a bit too late now um this whole deployment is is suspect if black castles i think he's still technically he can get done in as as i, as I mentioned it, bishop d3 is just very very strong yeah any f5 looks ridiculous this this looks as though it's asking for trouble, hitting the queen, take on b7, and then actually e7 is dropping. So yeah, it seems by this point castling's out of the question. So queen f5 is played, bishop takes d3, threatening yes evil discovered uh, checks to get the queen. Queen moves out of the way, but now uh, we have knight f6 check, which is absolutely forcing black to take and open up this lovely rook on the e file so uh ten technically um ten technically this is this is the strongest move actually and if castles uh knight g3 hitting the queen and just harassing the queen like this is is the strongest way to go apparently because where is the queen going here the queen's actually pretty suffocated in this position that that's actually covering g4 this position the queen's pretty suffocated this is this is the most crushing way of playing it actually uh yeah this this is terrible for black absolutely terrible that's clinically that's the most crushing way of playing it rook 81 this looks spectacular but actually uh it might not be that great for white we're, we're talking uh a modest advantage if black plays totally perfectly so black plays this move which seems to get coordination of the attacking pieces and threatening queen takes f3 immediately rook 81 and it's here black goes disastrously wrong because this does seem lucrative to take on f3 it does seem lucrative but apparently black can play queen h3 here so threatening mate 
uh, which is tricky actually because if g3 that would be horrible rook takes g3 for example using the pin queen takes and it's a total disaster for white it's a total disaster for white uh, yeah uh, <clears throat> uh, this, this is just losing for white if queen g4 yeah it's just it's just losing for white now so queen h3 is actually equal after bishop f1 not g3 queen f5 and apparently this position it looks incredibly scary but here queen f3 is just apparently it's better for black if bishop c5 so that's a terrible move and if king here this is just equal so black actually had technically equality with queen h3 it's fascinating because it looks as though um maybe you might not think this is the case but queen h3 but why shouldn't it be in a way you know black has got this g file road to white's king it's not beyond imagination for black to have something in this position just not the way he's played it though um so queen takes f3 is not the way to do things here because there's a series of forcing moves which expose the downside tactically of black's actual very specific configuration here it although it seems to be very logical to exploit that g file like this the forcing moves start now with uh, rook takes e7 and black should play this if he wants to survive a bit longer but he played knight takes e7 going into a forced mating sequence funny enough in this configuration this the downside of black's position here is his king's really in the center leading to very very big gigantic king safety issues but this forcing move is spectacular here now if you haven't seen this this is cool if, if you want to work out this combination so white's plan win i mean if you work out not just the first move but maybe the whole combination so 100 points if you can get the first move but 500 points if you know the entire combination here <clears throat> So I'll give you 20 seconds to mull this over white play. So it's a good test of forcing moves, which is another beautiful thing I think about historical games, that at least we can you know practice our forcing moves with nothing else on them, and they're not they're not too complicated. So white play here. <clears throat> All right, this is the marvelous tactic. The power of the, um, actually, the, the power of the double check is exposed in this position as the clue. Clinically, from a clinical perspective, I don't know if you've ever reasoned this, the double check is, is actually more clinical. I'm talking from an abstract theoretical perspective, independent of this position. It's just just quick, quick brief check if everyone is aware of this. The double check is more clinical because it's fundamentally reducing the opponent's options even more than a check because with two checks uh, you know the probability of being able to block both checks simultaneously is far less so usually as a general rule double checks are one of the most clinical tactical weapons you can use in chess and that's created here after queen takes d7 check there's not too many replies here this is super clinical stuff if king f8 then we can mate with this or bishop takes. So there's not too many replies. The king goes straight into this unfortunate firing line, and this lethal superclinical double check occurs, which really limits options. Black cannot just block one of the checks because there's the other. Aha, uh -huh, there's the other. Two checks is better than one. So with two checks, black's options are extremely limited. Extremely limited. If the king goes this way then bishop d7 is checkmate so the king goes this way but bishop d7 check now if the king goes this way then there's two checkmates either this one which looks pretty with the two bishops there or less pretty maybe you could argue with the pawn takes they're both mate anyway but the king goes the other way and not with the pawn because that would allow the king to escape but leaving the pawn as part of getting away getting all the escape squares boiling the frog the pawn is left on f6 bishop takes e7 and then we've got all the escape squares covered it is checkmate 
Black missed his chance to draw in this game, uh, but with high precision, Queen H3 would have drawn. Queen F3, Queen takes is very understandable, but with the king in the center, it's also a case of you know being very optimistic when having tactical liabilities hanging around. So if you've got tactical liabilities in the background of something optimistic, uh, you can sometimes expect backfires, and this really did backfire on Black. I mean, in theory, he had an open road to White's king. In theory, he had a fantastic bishop and a queen lurking around. Theoretically, you could say, in fact, Black had two bishops pointing at White's king, and yet, uh, with forcing moves, the you know it was Black's king which got it first, got done over first. Classic game, called the like the Evergreen Party, or game Party. Uh, game French game okay so the fourth game all right out of the five that I want to show you <clears throat> is this one to recap the immortal games this is um, Anson mm, this is Anson against no actually don't that one pardon me No, the fourth game I'd like to show you is Steinitz against Kurt Baldwin. Let's have a look at this. So Steinitz, the first world chess champion, played this game in 1895 at the Hastings tournament. Let's have a look. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6. We have this Gyoko Piano to start off with. <clears throat> c3 knight f6 again this is like a super popular idea just to construct the center like this it's super popular at the time uh in the 19th century games so d4 yeah white's getting that classic pawn duo but um after knight c3 probably the best move is knight takes e4 in line but this is the best move like this just yeah to get this sort of thing uh, where it might be um, actually a bit better for black but uh, black here played d5 and white should have a small edge here now after e takes white castles bishop e6 we have bishop g5 so the black king is still in the center bishop takes yeah forcing things here where actually uh, the black king is unfortunately kept a little bit too long in the center uh, f6 does weaken like this diagonal a bit and this diagonal that's a bit of a concession but if the king can go there in theory it looks as though the, the rooks are going to be connected but uh, queen e2 forces a defensive retreat now rook a c1 and now here if king f7 um it's uh it's not entirely losing for black this position but he didn't play that actually black played c6 which kind of backfires i think actually king f7 is probably technically uh the best move for black it's probably technically the best move I mean, there's sharp stuff like knight e5 and here threatening e6 but black should be able to survive this or not no actually it looks pretty bad <laughs> no not queen f5 queen f5 looks pretty ba bad after check and white white's actually doing really well here uh probably if if black wants to survive this position just te from a technical point of view it, it it might it might be okay it might be okay with best play but anyway black actually made things a lot worse instead of king f7 he actually made things a lot worse with c6 and you might find that funny how c6 makes things a lot worse why would it make things a lot worse you might wonder because doesn't it from a kind of logical common sense perspective doesn't it kind of blunt that rook in a way 
it makes things a lot worse actually technically there is a downside of c6 which didn't exist before that pawn on c7 is less prone to undermining on c7 than it is on c6 um, that might be a clue so white white's play here uh, so there is a downside of c6 so white's play what would you play in this position This is Steinitz against yeah, Baldwin. I think there's actually a film about Baldwin uh, going a bit nuts. I think there was a film depicted of him. I'm pretty sure I saw, and it was it was I think it was based on uh, Kurt von Baldwin uh, going a little bit crazy. Uh, let me just check his uh, profile on ChessGames.com. Yeah, he's got a sad story. He was born in 1861 in Berlin. In between 1883 and 1887, he took four years off to finish his law studies. In 1924, he died after falling from a window, either intentionally to commit suicide or due to misfortune. Uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, some film had been based on him, I suspect. I, I seem to remember a film. Uh, okay, but anyway. So the the move here, uh, yeah, the pawn is undermined with d5, which gives this really key pivot square for the knight via d4. It's interesting because actually the knight, you know, was deprived e5. They didn't have that many pivot squares, but after c takes now, knight d4, there's horrible threats of knight e6, knight b5, and maybe sometimes even knight b5, uh, knight f5, um, probably. Yeah, in fact, yeah, these are the key threats in order. Knight e6, knight b5, knight f5. It's interesting that pawn sack getting that gorgeous d4 square it is so crushing here uh, for the knight, for the knight's career prospect. So we have king f7. Now the knight goes into that wonderful e6 square, threatening horrible things like rook c7 now. Uh, black tries to parry that c file. But now queen g4, that knight's wreaking havoc now. It's creating weaknesses. Uh, so black has to parry uh, g7. He plays g6. And the problem here is, uh, well, that the queen's loose. Now white plays check to try and win the queen, but black protects. <clears throat> and it's interesting this diagonal focusing on c8 here white plays a very very tactically strong move in this position Steinitz was a really great tactician as well as like the father of modern positional play earlier in Steinitz career he was like the typical hacker influenced by the style of chess at the time but later he became more refined and started winning games with great knights and bishop pairs and the accumulation of small advantage theory. So he really was, as well as the first world champion, he was really the one that put positional play on the map, which really made games less random and, and less about chance and more about science. Because by the accumulation of a small advantage theory, uh, which he demonstrated quite vividly, because I think he was a magazine uh, annotator, he demonstrated over and over again how his games weren't so much prone to chance but as a result of a scientific perspective the accumulation of small advantages but here okay so there's a great tactic though he was also brilliant tactically so white play here so white play what would you play in this position uh, what forcing move Yeah, rook takes e7 check because the queen is trying to drag and drop the queen away from that c8. So if queen takes, we have rook takes c8 winning. And there's no no time to exploit this back row here because it's all running with check, alas. 
it's all running with checks so there's no chance to exploit the back row but this back row theme is evidence now because black actually played king f8 so the rook and the queen seem to be hanging as well as the knight in fact there's three pieces hanging here uh, so if white took the queen then he gets back row mated ha ha very funny and if if um yeah he takes um the queen yeah again back row mate uh so white actually he he can actually technically play knight takes h7 with advantage technically this line i'm just going to quickly show shows the strength of white's position queen b4 and it's dangerous for black even though black might be the exchange up this this is actually uh a good for white apparently yeah this this position but it's it's yeah but no white does a lot better though than that uh, from this position white does a lot better than knight takes h7 with his next bow which is rook f7 if you want to drag the queen away and it's protected by the knight away from that c8 still and now again a wonderful move rook g7 now this implies actually that if king takes this is running with check so there's no chance to exploit the back row <clears throat> and if queen takes we're back to uh rook takes c8 so it's rather brilliant rather brilliant so we have king h8 rook takes h7 check and here uh kurt von baldwin uh, resigns and i think the film i saw depicted him going crazy anyway he just he just left the tournament room he just left he abandoned the tournament room uh, in the film depiction okay now why did black resign here well cl clearly if if um, queen takes then we're back to rook takes c8 check so we can sort out the back row issue and the thing is with that pawn chipped away it's pretty uh, it's disastrous now with that pawn key pawn chipped away because if we go this way uh, there's a big difference now with that pawn not on the board um, well black I don't know either he resigned or he left no uh, some sources say he black resigned at this point after rook takes h7 okay so let's have a look so king g8 we have check now if here this is very different now because we have knight h7 check and then we can take here that's winning and if here we've got queen h4 check giving up a whole rook because after check 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 and black's getting mated in all variations here if he plays king here then it's mating two with check and check if he plays here it's mating five with check check if here check mate and if here then it's mating three with check check and mate yeah it's it's a wonderful um <laughs> a demonstration of various things it's playing with um a weak back row but so tactically with forcing moves that black never gets a chance to tap into white's weak back row this all forcing move stuff is working like magic here so yeah um just to recap by the way yeah on king f8 there was knight h7 so by chipping away that h pawn the queen is able to come in there yeah that was the way to go you know with all the forcing moves with all the checks so it works like magic the whole combination so steinitz um brilliant positionally brilliant tactically uh, revolutionary positionally he started the whole thing the accumulation of theory uh, for positional chess but uh, tactically also brilliant as well so Steinitz against Bartleben I'm pretty sure the film focused on this game with him walking out uh, not resigning just just going just leaving leaving the tournament thing um, Antonio Varela on stream says that he didn't resign left table on, on my chess games com source it says he resigned yeah I, I don't know so 1895 
the fifth game and final game I just want to show you tonight in this part one of, of looking at these key ten, 10 games let's have a recap of this amazing classic here it's another Morphe game so Morphe with black so Louis Paulson Louis Paulson against Morphe in, in New York uh, United States 1857 so Morphe totally ahead of his contemporaries uh, but also you know, he was very astute educationally um, as well he was that genius generally uh, so Bishop okay so he plays this is this is the four knights you know why it's called the four knights it's funny because there are four knights that have just seen it's called the four knights variation yeah funny enough Bishop b5 uh, now the move Bishop c5 was chosen by Paul Morphy in live book today it seems Bishop b4 just mirroring actually white this this continuation is is uh, seen quite a lot of games and it's thought to be a uh, slight advantage for white but okay in this game we have bishop c5 so not mirroring white both sides castle now we have knight takes e5 actually in this position it is possible to take here and allow d4 and apparently black um, mm, mm, huh, black might be uh, okay black might be okay probably best for white is f4 actually and white actually might be doing uh, okay but uh, Morphy plays actually um, against this little trick. He actually kind of ignored it with rook e8. Ignored it. So making it a gambit. Probably best for white is not to try and help black in any way whatsoever. Even the minutest hint of giving black any help should be avoided here uh, with the move knight f3, which I think gives white a small advantage. Uh, so not helping this bishop is probably a good idea giving back the pawn for example like this and helping one's own bishop instead and this could lead to a small advantage for white this position for example where white's doing fine but instead white decided he helped actually maybe inadvertently black by playing knight takes c6 and this bishop is celebrating now it's opened up this diagonal and black's fine actually with this bishop activating and white's bishop still asleep uh, so we have bishop c4 and that's kicked and now black also gets his pawn so he's you know gains two aggressive bishops out of this uh, now after rook takes white should probably try and do something about his bishop with d3 this should be okay for white both bishops are healthy but no white didn't do that white played bishop f3 and afterwards thought this bishop wasn't uh, worthy of being liberated and <laughs> and uh, in, amazingly white has not only helped the c8 bishop he's also now deciding to kill his own bishop on c1 funny uh, so lee Paulson, i don't know he had something against his own bishops uh, so queen d3 the bishop is a prisoner on c1 here uh, we have b4 bishop b6 a4 at least trying to activate the rook well he does care about some pieces that's taken and now bishop d7 yeah white's fractured the pawns but uh what about this rook it's got evil squares to go to to look at white's king we have rook a2 black dominates that central file now and is immediately threatening can you see the immediate tactical threat in this position which needs to be parried what is black threatening what is black threatening after this doubling of rooks it's not just pretty it's also pretty dangerous this doubling of rooks here because black what is black threatening here Can you see? Uh, 
Oh, sorry, is my volume a bit low? Oh, dear. Let me see. Oh, too late now. Oh, sorry. If my volume's low... Mm. Mm, seems to be killing my machine here. Great. Okay, I can't do anything about the volume, sorry. Black's threatening Queen takes F1. I hope everything's still streaming, is it? That that's the threat, because I'll give you a token move just to show that. Queen takes F1 and then rookie one is checkmate. So black black is threatening queen takes f1. <clears throat> so white plays the awkward move queen a6 indirectly defending f1. But now comes the brilliant bit. Morphy apparently took 12 minutes over his next move to assure himself the combination was sound. So 12 minutes he had to force a win in every variation. Try and force a win in every variation. By the way, while there's so many of you here, likes likes are really appreciated. <laughs> likes likes are really appreciated. While you while you're here on stream, by the way. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so what does black play in, in this position? So black's play, I'm sure most of you have seen this game before. So black plays what in this position? Which is technically, according to Stockfish, the absolute strongest move in the position. The absolute strongest move. Now at least two people on the stream do, have not memorized this game, have not committed this game to heart. Because you said bishop takes f2. No, no, no. Bishop takes f2. I, I, I get the logic, but you've just, you've just kind of, you've just waved the flag to say you haven't seen this game, which is wonderful. Some people have not seen this game. I am so happy. Fail Club and Gaelic have not seen this game. It looks logical, right? I get it. I get it. Your point is white gets mated, yeah. I get it. But the thing is, white actually has uh, and gets mated like this, right? V very good idea. Very good idea. But it's flawed. <laughs> it's actually flawed. And it's instructively flawed. Bishop takes f2. White play here. What is the refutation? Refutation? Of bishop takes f2. Refutation, please. 500 points. Bonus. What's the refutation of bishop takes f2? King just pops out. White's winning, apparently. King just pops out. Because remember, we're also covering e2 of the queen, not just f1. So there's no rook e2 here. Because I think... Actually, bishop takes e2 is only equal. This is only equal. But stronger is actually... Here, king g1. Because the queen is blocked from f1. And white's now winning. White's now winning here. This is winning for white, this position. Because the queen's hanging. <laughs> so if rookie one, we just take the queen. Yeah, so actually the king popping out for dinner with king takes f2 remarkably. And then just popping back. Doing its job. It's done its job of interrupting the queen from f1. Pops back and White's totally winning. 
That's the refutation of bishop takes f2 on a side note. I, I, I don't mind looking at obscure side notes of otherwise well-trodden games because you, you might not have appreciated some of the side notes. And it also celebrates the pure accuracy of Morphy avoiding this side variation which doesn't work. He actually played queen takes f3 which works, it totally works in all variations. That's a key thing. It works in all variations. Let's see. So takes, check, king h1. Now we have bishop h3. And white tried rook d1 here. If if he plays if he plays rook g1, then that fells to the forcing sequence, very clinical forcing sequence, takes and check and it, queen goes back, but just to get mated. So here, white tries a uh, rook d1. But now we have check. Bishop takes a free check. And here, um, the most optimal continuation is actually rook g2 with a mate in four. Morphy chooses a mate in five, basically, with bishop g2 check. We can have a look at the mate in four if you want and after. Bishop g2 check. Only one move. Bishop h3 check. Only one move. But now, the point is, the two bishops combine together to take away the escape squares. So this is like a case of a quiet move here, avoiding the frog move because it's taking away escape squares in the midst of when you mix up forcing moves with taking away escape squares. That's lethal. That's lethal combinatory vision because this is like if you look at the other moves, they were pretty forced, right? But this move it is kind of forced because it's actually threatening bishop g2 to terminate white immediately now. Bishop g2, checkmate. So it's it's completely lost for white. Um, you might think, oh, hold on. Well, queen c6, we just take that. There, we just take that. It's not defending g2. Um, so queen f1 was played to defend g2 like that. Black just took. And he's the exchange up here. He's got two rooks and a bishop. He's the ex He's the exchange up. Sorry, he's not the exchange up. Ah! What happened to the forced mate in five as well? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the forced mate in five, by the way, seems to have gone as well. So we need to revisit the forced mate in four and the forced mate in five. But let's get to the end of this game. So he took on f1 and played rook e2. And this is, this is really uh, a winning position. It's, it's a massively winning position. Rook a1 was played. And we have now rook h6. d4, which hits the rook. But there's an interruption tactic, bishop e3, which threatens mate. And white resigned here. Uh, this threat of mate, if white tries bishop takes, then there's a mate in two like this. Takes and then either rook, sorry, not either rook. Sorry, rook eg2 is mate. So that's totally winning anyway, this coordination of the two rooks and the bishop. Now the forced mate in four. Okay, so after, after bishop uh, e3, white resigned. Let's revisit though the forced mate in four. Let's rewind a little bit. This position here, the forced mate in four, no, first of all, the forced mate in four was actually rook g2. Morphy's move was bishop g2, but rook g2 is the most clinical forced mate in four. With the slow motion threat of rook takes and rook h1, which unbelievably, why it's not in any position at all to parry. So escape square has been taken here. 
White's not in any position to parry this. If he tries rook e1, then rook takes f2. It's a force mate in two now, taking there. And then mating. Yeah, so there was an absolute forced mate there in four with rook g2. It's funny, rook g2, not bishop g2. funny the bishop on f3 is actually quite nifty it's it's already covering some escape squares so it's already in a way ideally posted you could say on f3 because it's covering two key escape squares so rook yeah rook g2 there's no it's actually a force mate in three whatever white does even like imagine a totally desperate move check uh double check and mate the bishops are really killing white here yeah, that rook g1 check. And here, there's um, rook g1 is double check and mate. So that's why there's the forced mate in four is actually, isn't that weird? Rook g2, who would have thought that? Rook g2 is the forced mate in four. Now, in Morphe's continuation, after the check, there's actually a forced mate in four here. He played bishop h3 check. The forced mate in four here is actually bishop e4 check. Uh, so there's only one move here and now can you see a forced mate in three so forced mate in three what does black play here black to play forced mate in three here Give him time to catch up. No, 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 not Rook G2. No, 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 Rook G2, no. In fact, White wins after Rook G2 with D4, blunting the Bishop. That's winning for White. After takes, this is just winning for White. And Bishop E3, no. Oh, no one's finding this one. This is interesting. So there's a force mate in three here no one can find. <laughs> okay, all right, bishop f5. The killer threat of bishop h3 checkmate. So if queen e2, we have check and then um, checkmate because the queen's pinned. If f4, that weakens that diagonal, we just have checkmate there or checkmate here. Yeah, bishop f5 is just absolutely forcing mate. Yeah, so it's funny that, um, yeah, it's it's funny. So let's just recap there about the, the mates just, just out of interest. Uh, so here, the most the most concise is rook g2, force mate in four, and here, instead of bishop h3, we have bishop e4 check as the most concise. So um, I'm, this game really struck me for a long time um, at the time because you know the brilliant queen sack. But it wasn't it wasn't the perfect mating sequence after it. You know, it, it did lead to a crushing position. It, but anyway, but it, the the brilliancy of the queen sack is is just absolutely staggering. Um, White did help Black a bit, as I mentioned, with killing his own bishop and helping Black's bishop and then Black dominating the E file and yeah I mean it was wonderful forcing moves anyway but uh, okay maybe not the most 
what I call clinical continuation, where you're trying to restrict to the absolute maximum uh, the opponent's replies, but you know it's still pretty clinical. So anyway, I hope you got something from these games, revisiting them. Uh, so we can carry that on next week, maybe if you like. So remember, likes, likes appreciated, and we're going to stop here. Um, I'll try and cover five other games around this era next week. So um, yeah, comments, questions, likes appreciated. So see you next week. Have a good week. I um, hope that was fun. I, I kind of enjoyed it as well. So I hope you did. Okay, thanks very much. Comments, questions on YouTube.